Mayday, Dave! No. That's the first two words of line 488 of book 10 of the Odyssey. Which is an epigraph to a, the poem I'm going to read, or one of the epigraphs. Uh, the part where Odysseus is, uh, runs into Achilles, and he says, they'd rather be above than below. <laughs> if you know. And the other epigraph to this uh, po poem is from uh, sonnet number 80 by Theodore Berrigan. Dear Chris, hello, it's 5.15 a.m. I rage in a blue shirt at a brown desk in a bright room. <laughs> and the third epigraph of this poem is from, I believe it's from Samuel Beckett, uh, Mal the book of Malloy. And it is to the effect that if you can't chew your way through a wall, you've always got your fingernails. <laughs> and the remaining epigraph of this poem is from uh, is ripped off from William Blake, and I use it in the poem. I've been working on this poem for eight years. It's called the struggle. I went to a party the other night. I wanted to fill my brain with light. I drank myself a bottle and I started drinking wine. Thought pretty soon I'd be feeling fine, but I couldn't get high. I couldn't get high. Put down the bottle and I whipped out my pipe and I stuffed it full of grass and I gave myself a lie. I cooked, I puffed, I smoked and I choked. After a while, my heart was nearly broken. Ed Sanders was a founding member of the Fugs and is the author of The Family, Shards of God, Tales of Beatnik Glory, and 20,000 A.D. On tonight's program, you'll hear Ed Sanders read his poetry together with excerpts from an interview with Lynn Rosechild Harris. For poetry, rage to be free, rage in the moon, moan, ah, ha, he, rage of the cow tower fawning in a fane, rage for the fever, ah, ha, he, rage on the ziggurat, rage in the heavens, rage of the raga, ah, ha, he, rage of the air blimp rising up in air sky, lunge dead for food by rumbly stomach beasties, rage of the star shard, rage reached by robots, oily drools, oily laughs, ah, ha, he, though it's hard to see at what they laugh. For in the dream, the sun priests rake their tons of iron dust out o'er the thin, flat cards of ivory, wide as the sky. And I know what Ted means by raging and what drives Alan onward. Rage and make mudras, rage and sing twang, rage and sing shriek, the warbles of antique Persian throats are saved on the spidery tapes of eternity. God, how much fun it is to laugh and lunge among the peace doves, sneering one day at the ghost of Achilles, laughing one day at the ghost of Achilles, 
the third day crying, the fourth day pretending to be the spew-sarked warrior himself, hovering near the worm cans of Hades, waiting for some new mutant Odysseus, waving a ray gun his way into the slobbering slobber of slobber. The fifth day, ready to cry again beneath the lake of fire or the rock lips of which the torch-bearing apes of knowledge watch your sin grime bubble to the surface. The sixth day, wear a new silk shirt and sit with the rest of the gang on the fenders of the mercury outside Hansel's drugstore. Shit, man. Who gives a flaming car crash about Achilles? The seventh day to have a dream of love in which Achilles tries to pick you up waving a tube of KY jelly in a Times Square skee-ball booth. <laughs> the eighth day, wake up famished with world lack, stare in ignorance at the floor and then to smile in a flash then to laugh in a flash, to want to know in a flash, body tones rising to the verse froth flash, flash, muscle skin tensing in the verse froth rage, rage, rage for poetry, rage to be free, rage in the moon moan, ah, ha, he, rage of the cow tower fawning in a vein, rage of the raga, ah, ha, he, rage on the ziggurat, rage in the heavens, rage of the raga, ah, ha, he, rage of the star shard, rage beats by robots, oily drools, oily laughs, ha, ah, ha, he. All these uh, gurus, uh, two-car garages. I don't. Uh, <laughs> a bunch of bonk from a punk, in my opinion. This poem uh, uh, speaks of an era of, uh, uh, from the uh, summer of 1973, when when one wasn't sure uh, whether Nixon was going to play his. Uh, uh, Achtung uh, option out and uh, uh, grab a hegemony of uh, some permanence for himself. So uh, you will recall that that, that summer was uh, of '73 is when, when uh, the cat went into uh, the hospital and uh, in the same room as Johnson had his heart attack, you know, with the red phone and everything. Uh, and we didn't know, you know, everybody was very suspicious of Nixon as to what what were his real secret motives. So maybe he was packing himself in there with uh, the head of naval intelligence, you know, and getting ready to grab it all up but, uh, and it all ha also ha happened to be at that point in time at my uh, 34th birthday meaning that I you know you're in that big race with uh, Dylan Thomas to make your liver grow disproportionately and try to escape your body and uh, you've uh, out outlasted uh, what's his name uh, from the cross and uh, so it, it I thought it was appropriate to write a birthday poem on my uh, 34th year which was uh, August 17th uh, 1973 the 34th year. Today read Steelwork by Sorrentino, a hundred selected poems by E.E. E. Cummings, the metaphysical poets, especially Thomas Carew, an elegy upon the death of the Dean of Paul's Dr. John Dunn, made a list of letters to write, one, two, three, four, five, six, worked on six short stories, to know that mirth supplies divisions, to live as tense art, Watch friends lie in a bathtub of blood. D.A. Levy, call his mother, say he's gonna go to San Francisco, work in the post office, or maybe kill himself. Dave Hazelton, with whom canoed out to confront Polaris submarines, 1961. 1968, came back from Amsterdam. Saw him one day, he lost his teeth, jumped from the bridge, gone, the editor of Synapse, Berkeley, 1965. So it's there like an alphabetical file of autopsy reports. Can't face life like a fistfight. Must crawl down lonely arroyos. Rain washes the rodents down the sluice. Fire wipes the Bronx. And to watch Richard Nixon trying to summon pity as he goes into the hospital, same room as Johnson heart attack, probably wired with special lines, a bedside red telephone, so that if he should suffer swiftly, maybe die, he could still phone in those sacks and Minuteman missiles squelch the world. A. To float along. B. 
to become a dandy. C. To practice as a scholar. D. Give up, get farm. E. To prepare a list of books to write this decade. Proceed. F. Push self toward ego dissolution. Peace in practice. Serve. Lick stamps forever in a mailing room of protest bulletin. G. Bowery. H. Make movies only, or maybe write a 40-year opera poem. I. Give up literature. Write a manifesto about a new mode of painting. Sneer. Work hard on canvas. Decorate spaceships. J. Found a radical socialist quarterly. Muckrake. Poetics. Sedition. K. Phil Whalen. Copy everything he does. When I stopped drinking, I found I had this extra day in my life every day because I didn't have to take Excedrin and, and get get rid of my hangover, or, nor did I hang out at the Lion's Head and uh, eat lanes and so forth uh, every night. So uh, anyway, uh, on New Year's Day last, when everybody else was saying ay 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 and aging about a year as a result of the revelry, uh, I was sitting there without a hangover on New Year's Day, typing away on my poem. Mm. How did it... Uh, 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 well, though I had worked on it for a considerable amount of time, but I'd finally consolidated the notes and everything. And wrote it. And you read at the St. Mark's thing last January 1st? Yes, I did. Read after Jackson McGlow, or, or oh, I read after Taylor Mead, that's right. That, when was that, about 1 o'clock in the morning? No, no, <laughs> no, no. I, I got pull. I, you know what I mean, going there and there. It's like any poetry reading. You find out that the most important event when you enter a big reading like that is find out who's got the list and then to approach the list person with having in mind a uh, wholesale uh, violation of the rules and move your n name from 2 a.m. to like 9.30 p.m., you know, then you're, you know. And if you have a reputation for not for reading so long, they generally are willing to put you on, but they, they you know, all people who have to Translate the Babylonian creation epic or something. They usually stick you away in the end. You know what I mean? Or if you want to hold the same syllable for right. thirty-five minutes, then they say, "Well, we'll put you on a little later, Dad." <laughs> Try to shed some light on this these dark kernels of Babel. This poem speaks of uh, my concern that citizens should, will have to become investigators uh, and not leave the investigation up to uh, hot shots with. Uh, you know, with uh, Pulitzer Prizes and so forth, but uh, to uh, you know, confront uh, within the electromagnetic, uh, you know, uh, nightmare, uh, those uh, forces which uh, need to be confronted. Anyway, I wrote this for the New Year's Eve reading at the St. Mark's Church last, uh, last uh, January 1st. The Age This is the age of investigation, and every citizen must investigate. For the pallid tracks of guilt and death, slight as they are, suffuse upon the retentive electromagnetic data retrieval systems of our era, and let the investigators not back away one microunit from their investigations. For the fascist hirelings of gore await in the darkness to rise up this year to shoot away the product of the ballot box. And if full millions do not investigate, we will see the age of gore, and the criminals of the right will rise up drooling with shellfish toxin to send their berserker blitz of mod Manchurian malefactors mumbling with motorized Beowulfian trance instructions to chop up candidates in the name of some businessman's moan of national security. And this is the age of investigative poetry, when verse froth again will assume its prior role as a vehicle for the description of history. And this will be a golden era for the public performance of poetry, when the Diogenes Liberation Squadron of strolling troubadours and muckrakers 
will roam through the citadels of America to sing opposition to the military hitmen who think the United States is some sort of corpse farm. And this is the age of left-wing epics with happy endings. And this is the age of garbage. And we're not talking here about garbage, self-garbage, but an era of robotic querulousness, how at the onset of a time when the power of a country is up for grabs, the garbage hurlers, attired in robes of military industrial silk, arise to hurl, as swift in their machinations as a chorus in the ice capades. And none of us will trudge this era without a smirch face, waft of thrilly offal, dumped upon our brows of social zeal. And the pus suck provocateurs, armed with orbiting plates of dog vomit, will leap at us while we stand chanting our clue-ridden dactyls of know the new facts early, know the new facts early, know the new facts early. And do not back away one microdot just because some CIA weirdo morph whose control agents never ended World War II invades your life with a mouthful of curdled exudate from the head of the Confederate Intelligence Agency. And this is the age of the triumph of beatnik messages of social foment coded into the clatter of the mass media over 20 years ago. <laughs> How do we fall down to salute with peals of <laughs> that the beats created change without a drop of blood? In 1965, it was all we could do to force cajole the writers for Time magazine not to reinforce the spurious Anslinger synapse that pot puff leads to the poppy fields. But now the states are setting hemp free. Ten years of coated foment. <laughs> Yesterday, the freeing of verse. Today, pot. Tomorrow, free food in the supermarket. <laughs> and finally, let us ne'er forget that this is the age of ha-ha-he. Ha ha he is such a valuable tool in the tides of social transformation. Ha ha he will set you free from worm farm angst. Ha ha he will even curdle the fires of jealousy. Ha ha he outvotes the warrior caste. Ha ha he doth whelm the self devouring quarrel. Ha ha he peels out through all the cosmos, mandorled with poet angels holding Plato's seven single syllables in a tighter harmony than the early Beach Boys. And this is the poet's era, and we shall all walk crinkle-toed upon the smooth, cold thrill of Botticelli's shell. I never uh, proselytized on the subject of vegetarianism, uh, uh, although I've been a vegetarian for 13 years. However, I could not resist uh, uh, playing around with the impending era when vegetarians will uh, make their move, and then they will be different. Anyway, this is a poem called uh, Vegetable Cutlets. There is a place where hamburgers never bubble in the sun, where meat is ne'er gnashed neath tooth warp, and that is where my heart doth dwell, in errant pastures of cud gobble, in parlors of moo, moo, moo. I had done some research. First of all, I wrote a long article on uh, on these uh, on cattle mutilations. A really wonderful, thrilling subject. Which, uh, and uh, in the in the uh, process of uh, doing research uh, for that article uh, w about these mutilations, which are occurring in some 22 western states, apparently uh, uh, by uh, either a, a, a unit of the government or a unit of very wealthy people who are, for some reason or other, uh, pick, uh, flying in by night and mutilating these animals. Is this is this the tongue cutting out or yeah, something I, else? Yeah, somebody sent me a around. tongue in the mail last summer, and so. A uh, cow tongue. Uh, Was this before or after your article had come? No, 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 no. Uh, 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 June, last June, just about. To, in fact, this is the anniversary of receiving a mail, my first rotting cow tongue. Really, you haven't really lived till you've got a cow tongue <laughs> and a shoe pox in the mail. Anyway, 
It was, you know, dressed to the art. It, well, I usually, usually they, they send me uh, bloody thumbprints or something, you know. I mean, I've got pic I want pictures of the, of the fugs with, a, with an X on my forehead and my torso cut up uh, in the picture. But, but this is the first uh, uh, cow tongue I got. It was really, really uh, disgusting. <laughs> But anyway, so anyway, that triggered off my figure. Well, these turkeys are going to send me a cow tongue. I better find out who they are and what what the who, what what are the uh, options or the possibilities. So I did a long a lot of research on mm -hmm. this group that's cutting out cow tongues and uh, cow udders and so forth, figuring they might be the one. I wasn't sure. But anyway, so but 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 the point being that is uh, that I began developing information on uh, uh, plutonium and uh, a bomb terrorism uh, because uh, one of the things this group that mutilates animals was suspected of doing was uh, stealing uh, plutonium from the uh, Kerr-McGee uh, plutonium extracting or uh, uh, compacting uh, uh, plant in uh, Crescent, Oklahoma, right around the time that Karen Silkwood was murdered or, uh, yeah. or, 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 or was uh, or died. Eliminated. Or, or had a wreck, let's put it that way. Yeah. So that uh, I, I, I began to therefore open up a file on uh, plutonium terrorism and the possibilities thereof. I also did some research on uh, uh, people trying to break into Minuteman missile silos in northern Colorado, and I find that that uh, that uh, you know a couple of three or four drunk old boys in a pickup truck uh, could probably go, and uh, you know a couple of crowbars, and uh, and uh, you may want them with a little security clearance could probably rip off a, a nuclear device. Karen Silkwood in her refrigerator, I know they had uh, they found uh, some sort of hideous. Uh, pastrami mickey or some of plutonium where they i guess it was a package of bologna or salami uh, which is completely permeated with plutonium and also a package of cheese so that uh, 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 in a refrigerator completely completely uh, infiltrated with the totally death causing uh, levels of plutonium and then this was, was tracked nice? all over the house from from the source in the refrigerator so the the thinking was and I I would agree with that particular thinking that that would say that that somebody for some reason, went in there and zapped her with that and figured she'd eat the cheese and then get offed. And then they could always say, like the FBI subsequently said, that, that she was taking out plutonium and eating it and they were stuffing it uh, in her armpits and forth, you know, I mean, really, j just because she wanted to prove her point, you know, really de de deprecating her personality, which I, I find to be heinous and awful. Uh, was that was one thing I looked into, the possibility that the, her death may have been connected with these, these uh, this uh, alleged theft, and but from the uh, plant there of this plutonium for whatever reasons, but uh, we never could really develop any hard evidence on it. It turned out that the uh, record keeping uh, mechanism for that plant uh, was so sloppy and they had it lying around like uh, pieces of pastry or something. It was very sloppy, so it would really have been impossible to find out uh, if there was much missing. But in all these plants, they have this thing, MUF, the material mm -hmm. unaccounted for, which is substantial in most plutonium processing plants. This is from, uh, from what? From uh, 20,000 AD, and it's a little, little versicle uh, dedicated to uh, Judith uh, Molina and Julian Beck of the Living Theater. And it expresses, uh, such as it does, uh, my, a f personal philosophy I have about uh, nonviolent direct action it's called Homage to Love Zap. I know that the robot is struggling to form itself to chew into death the leaves of the rose. I know with my soul eye that the spirit of the fascist sewer tries with its might to teach all mammals to live as garbage so that the muscleless lumps lie down in the metal cans and beg for the lids to be lowered. I know that it is useless, yet with my last breath I shriek, I raise my fist, I shout showers of love bursts above the golf carts. I violate the dictates of the werewolf freaks of war. I circle up with lover friends to drive to distraction the uncreative circuits of the robot fist. Every day is May Day when you dance the dance. Things line up to block the molecules of my imagination, but I just add them to the frantic clutter. Come, O oh love zap. 
Calm, O oh, thrilling, never seen imaginations. Come and take me upon thy thrilling rides. Come and take me. Come on, come on, come on. I got interested in writing story poems uh, in a few years ago, having run out of uh, subjects to write in my uh, uh, sex maddened years of uh, verse when I wrote about the such things, uh, or most chiefly erotic, erotic and stuff. And uh, so uh, and then I finished this book on the Manson family in the summer of 1971, and. Uh, didn't it was really faced with the you know alcoholism and nervous breakdowns and uh, you know hysteria and the incredible attention of the media and so forth and so I, I retreated into my little room and wrote this poem. I, uh, little poem? How yeah, many, how many sp- pages is well, it? Well, I spent uh, three months on it. Well, I wrote two long poems at the same one. One for John Sinclair, uh, who was in jail at the time in uh, Michigan for. Uh, the 10 years for two joints case mm. and I wrote a long poem about his condition and at the same time I wrote this which was sort of therapy is that included in 20,000 AD? Uh, yes it is actually well I rarely read it it's in college reading so forth it's called the VFW crawling contest The VFW Crawling Contest Wet smells above the counters of pine Stock tanks full of pabst End of the May Day picnic Unpainted one by twelve Spanked by the slaps of raw hands selling Kersplipped, kersplipped And o'er and o'er the tabs were pulled in the spring breeze As the endomorphs massed together in a groveling huddle to begin the VFW crawling contest. You should have seen them, 25 or 30 humans packed on hands and knees, some wearing basketball knee pads, work gloves, chaps, four or five pairs of jeans to ward off ouch. There was the air of festival, one of the crawlers with a propeller-topped beanie atop above his brow, men with their dogs, men of position, appliance stores, and rectitude, At sunset, the first day, they began to yell at me, Come on, Harry, come on and quit. My Levi's were wasted at the knees, which were raw like floor burns at a roller rink. I lay in the dry weeds. I wadded my poplin golf jacket up for a pillow, thought of the moon. There was a screech of brakes and a sharp voice. Not in here, you don't. A teenage boy lurched from the jalopy and puked on me. An oval of white lightning plus God knows something with pasta and marinara sauce. I am happy. In the town dump, I saw the local fire freak stand staring transfixed drool on chin, looking at the fire of the evening burning hands in his raincoat pocket. Quietly I crawled past, not wanting to tempt his, tempt his zippo, For a minute I crawled up upon the rusty bed springs and bounced upon my back, watching the sunset, smelling the mutant steak sauce and burning tin cans, mosquitoes mating above the muck. Late that night a highway department tractor nearly pulled a tamesis job on my lower legs. Crawling up the hill, along the dreaded edge of the interstate fear via Sweating like a rodent of the ditch. Hushom, hushom, hushom. Tones dropping on the sh all through the night. Rusty monsters roaring past. Bloody fingered, bloody toed, the hours and days and weeks went by with tedium. Crawling through mire on the way to muck. And I've seen all the muds, red muds, green muds, brown muds, muds mixed with sand, gray mud, mud that smelled. God, had I crawled through a sewer. There's a lot of protein hurled to the roadsides, almost unbroken lines of chaff across the country. Random splotches of yum-yum, colophons of beer tabs, 
tire hunks, condoms, have a tampa wrappers, and paper cups. I received in my oily mitts the chaff, my hands, as if I had dipped them in a vat of rubber cement, filth bits spackling the glue. My posture grew wormy. To wit, I could only slide along on my stomach or back or side, and more and more I had to rely on my tongue, a terrible mistake. Nor sucret nor lozenge could scrape free the gizzardly condition of my larynx. I blushed to gobble the bladelets of grass bent with grime, but grass was my Alka-Seltzer, after a questionable roadside gunge gobble. Every night I saw the sunset, but somehow shifted in my sleep to awaken facing the dawn, a habit which later saved my life. I learned to sing, fearless, I yodeled, shameless, shameless, singing for my soul like Mrs. Meyerhoff in a 1953 Christmas pageant, my sim-paternal gravel raga. And I offered prayer to God, praised be, O Theos. Enter my gnarled, cracked knuckles and penitent mind. I am a cur most foul. I am wax, O butterfly, O Deus, help me to scoot along under thy temporary grace before thou shalt crunch me beneath thy purple sandals. Help those in pain, help me, help thy ghosts assemble, help the perfections reappear, help! Somehow I reached a long downgrade. The top of my head bashed a plank. Shouldn't have closed my eyes. Hooked the edge of my skull up over the board's edge so that the splintery edge of the board fit in with a groove of my left temple. Ouch. I lay then on my back, flopping on top of the board, wet sausage on a spoon. And then, as if it were a surfboard in a downslide of watery gravel, I scooted down, inch by inch, pushing off with my toes and feet, and I began to get the beat in my Irish soprano. Hummed old Beach Boys singles. I got the beat. Music throbbed in the stomp dust, poofing around my eyes. On my back, it would take me sometimes five to ten minutes to crawl past a dead animal. How humiliating when a line of ants would abandon the flattened possum and try to take me. As I approached the drive-in restaurant, saliva began to drip from beneath my tattered lips. No automobiles parked silently full of potato-eating families did leave the lot as I rounded the bend out of a clump of ditch weeds, when just like a performer onto a stage, my head appeared in the bright lights, first just my noggin on the oily plank, and then the beauteous vista of my fragrant bod, staring up at the white framed screen of the order window. A hot dog and baked beans, please, just drop it in the tar. Some humans would try to look casual when the saucers land. The Sears mod Taurus neck in white bells driving a supercharged Mustang 350 parked, stepped over me, ordered a banana malt plus palm frite, looking good, looking cool. I herped away with my wiener and beans to suffer luncheon within a nearby concrete culvert, and vom, 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 the rains began. I crawled from the culvert into the vomarama, filth to lave. A typical drop would strike my stomach waddled like a streaked muck meatloaf to curdle and scour a speck of dust which later drops would bear away. The waters rose. I propped my head upon an old pile of what appeared to be a wadded-up overcoat, all stuck together and glued with last summer's cobwebs. Popsicle sticks zoomed past like narrow rafts shooting some western rapids, and the storm was not without its tragedies as, snuffed by the sky, mice and weak birds puked past in the sewery spew. An act of the storm caused me to roll down into the ditch full of water past three-foot boulders of happiness. 
My head slid first into the rivulet, which was surprisingly deep. Then, like a fallen rafter, the rest of me plopped into the smush. I lay still, as the water swirled over the top of my sunken head. Some sort of branch swept down the creek during my subsurface reverie and lodged above me so that my head was pressed down and trapped. Talk about panic. My left arm flailed like a maniac's. My right arm wedged itself beneath in the rocky sludge. And I rolled a quarter turn trying to push my head up through the washed-out elm. And the answer, alas, was a muck dredge with my face. I turned full face down, lifted my buttocks, scrunched my knees forward. Then, like an orator begging for votes, I began to burrow with my mouth in the ditch bed, toying gobs of mud out of the way, mud gobs bubbling down the sluice in the current. After about ten frenzied oral dredge scoops, I freed my head and rolled to safety, many minutes of barf spits to clean my mouth. The rain stopped. Buzz saw bronchitis began to utter itself in the night, and all was zzzz. As my good friend Morpheus began to throw me out of heaven, I opened my right eye first to grant it the grace of light, and there it was, the boot, the heel of which was grinding my nose, grinding left, grinding right, in a black V of ouch, up against the wall, crippled punk, hissed a voice from above the boots. I obliged, rolling over a few feet, to flatten myself supine in keening obeisance against a shed, observing a surface service of soft whimpers at the wet foundation of which... Okay, let's see some identification. I fumbled for my credit cards, begging for forgiveness while gumboots debated aloud with harumphs and groans where or not to run me in. But never so sonorous a whine did win over the heart of a policeman as the tale of the VFW crawling contest. Ha, ha, spinach ears. She visited each afternoon during that wonderful hundred-mile stretch in the lower foothills. I'd scoot till we came to a croft by the side, then head inland fifty feet or so, say grove of locust, say grove of willow trees. She didn't take notes or bear a recorder, so maybe she wasn't a writer. Together we'd sip a Coca-Cola. She brought me some of those bend-around plastic straws. And the day before we met, I passed a football field whose garbage heap contained a teeming mound of gauze, adhesive tape, and rubber pads that had covered the damaged knees and arms and feet for the big game Saturday past. And I just crawled into the midst of it, and somehow the bulk of it congealed around me as onward I crawled, a mummy of gauze. Joy whelmed my eyes as, kneecaps in gravel, she slid toward me showing herself spread in a tattersall dress, climbing above me, leaning above groins clinking in sunshine, the sunshade of her shoulders on my face, kisses, portable radio, talking for thirty days, then poof. I was not man enough to get up to follow her, and she was not about to crawl. She vanished with no excuse, and on I crawled, out of her range, in the winter heights. The slitherous rocks sorely did render my lore hawks into dog food. Birds flocked in a Jungian horde to peck up the hawk hunts deserta. So, at a smashed mailbox, sundered in the dirt, a booger clod of loam still a-clinging to its four-by-four four post, painted white, I paused, bludgeoned the box from the post. I am happy. I bent it, beat it into the shape of a gravy plate, and then lay upon it. And to keep it from slipping away, I tied a ditch-sucked dog leash from each side of the flattened container, and looped the rope around my neck, and thus I could slither, painless, face-down, elegant, fop-flop. Very cold, I woke up about forty-five minutes before dawn, face attacked by muskrat. 
The little punk was troughing chunks out of my frozen cheek. Rat cage in Orwell. Tug on a piece of it. Pulled it out like a snail and scratching around it as if to dig a moat. Ouch! I wadded up my body, then drop kicked. The gnawing little beast went growling away just as dawn began to lean with rubicund bosom above the fir-topped hills. Tears met the dripping. I creeped into the doctor's office to beg for penicillin. It took me days of useless pus crawl to reach him. I counted them, three days, 15,000 drips. It must have been that prophylactic I slithered across last week in Axel's corner. Quite a thrill. Hot, dusty tum-tum upon a roomy gray balloon. A maintenance vehicle finally got me <laughs> in the legs. A snapping sound, then motor fading distant. No arteries broken, however, but it was like crawling with fish hooks in the leg. And like a drunken poet, mumbling in a moment of weakness, on to Stockholm, on to Stockholm, the void did heal my legs, and I prayed to the lake. O oh, lake of shooting stars, the eye souls zzz, zzz, fall to fulfillment beneath thy surface, merely to touch thee, lake, to walk in thy surf froth blown by holy winds. This is my prayer, O oh, heavenly lake, just to rest within the merest lattice of sunbeams touching you, somehow saved. And I began to collect metal items, which I attached to my body with twine, pipes, hubcaps, lunch pails, hinges, hasps, forty or fifty pieces of metal dragging behind me. Some of my metals I dragged on lines as far as fifty feet away. All excited, I entered the forest, flailing arms, pieces of metal flopping in abandon, scraping and shoving with my lower stubs. And I looked back. Staring o'er my forehead, looking at the long forested slope into the high country, the crags and secret gorges, thousands of feet above and miles away, I crawled, I groveled, I conquered. My baby done left me. My baby done went to the drive-in movie with someone else And I feel like home age Yuddy lady -lay. My baby done left me My baby done parked by Coonskin Creek with someone else And I feel You've just been listening to Ed Sanders reading his poetry together with excerpts of an interview with Lynn Rosechild Harris. The recording engineer was Margaret Mercer. Produced by Mike Sapol with technical production by Bill O'Neill. Wait, and have a nervous don't, breakdown. Don't. You can't even have a nervous breakdown anymore if you're well known without people coming up to you and say, "Look, I want to interview you, man." You know, and here we go. So it's all these these weird uh, f uh, video films. <laughs>